In Every Day is Extra, New York Times bestseller, John Kerry looks back on his life from his boyhood as the son of a diplomat to his service in Vietnam, returning to deliver one of the most powerful pieces of Senate testimony in U.S. history. Each day to facilitate the process by which the United States washes her hands of Vietnam, someone has to give up his life so that the United States doesn't have to admit something that the entire world already knows, so that we cannot say that we've made a mistake. Someone has to die so that President Nixon won't be, and these are his words, the first president to lose a war. And we are asking Americans to think about that. Because how do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam? How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? Kerry went on to become a prosecutor in Massachusetts, lieutenant governor under Michael Dukakis, five-term senator, including four years as head of the Foreign Relations Committee. In 2004, he became the Democratic presidential nominee. And in 2013, Secretary of State under Barack Obama. It's all laid out, the highs, lows, everything in between in his new memoir. John Kerry joins me now. Good to see you. I apologize for leaving out the encyclopedia salesman thing. But, <laughs> you know, Secretary Kerry, when you see experience. yourself as a kid... Yeah. At that major moment in American history, what kind of feeling does that evoke in you? It's a constant reminder that's, that's the person I want to be today. Do you think Double you are tooth. that person? I do. I particularly do right now, and I think I was as Secretary of State. I think I could have used a little more of him when I was running. Uh, but uh, very much so. I mean, I'm as angry as the next person about the dysfunctional Washington, the broken system, and there are things we can do to fix it, and we need to desperately. Let's get to your reaction on a couple of things. I'm going to play a couple of quick excerpts from the president's speech yesterday to the U.N. General Assembly. I want to get your reaction. Here's President Trump. My administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. I didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. Iran's leaders sow chaos, death, and destruction. They do not respect their neighbors or borders or the sovereign rights of nations. So what's your reaction both to the laughter, which I've never heard before, and to his comments, not just that, about Iran? Obviously, you the lead negotiator well, in the Iran nuclear deal. I suspect that uh, at first Donald Trump didn't probably understand that they were really laughing at him. Um, but it's very clear that people held that statement in contempt. I mean, it was just laughable. It was laughable. It got the response that it deserved. Uh, to suggest that uh, the president has barely passed anything, who has operated almost exclusively by executive order, whose sole accomplishment that's made Republicans happy, well, he has two, a tax bill, which is totally unfair, rewarding billionaires, the top end of our economy, at a time when 51% of America's income goes to 1% of Americans. That's not sustainable, Jim. I mean, just as a political equation by which we will live together, that's not sustainable. So I think um, they understand, but they particularly understand what he's doing to global relationships, Does that to worry the trade you, though, war. As a former representative of our country, the leader of the United States is being laughed at by his fellow leaders. Does that not bother you? Of course it does. Are you kidding? I, I've never, ever. Traditionally, the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, has the privilege of going to the United Nations, really defining the agenda, wrapping the rest of the world into a set of goals that are worthy and that represent a value system. That's not what happened. He walked away from most of the world. In fact, he, he, he cast aspersions on the rest of the world, and he literally uh, uh, gave leaders in the rest of the world cause to uh, be deeply concerned about whether America will be there or not be there, what role we'll play and how. I, want to put, uh, I assume the second thing you're going to say accomplished was the uh, confirmation of Neil Gorsuch. That would Correct. have been. So is, speaking right. of that, and it's relevant, also at the UN, he made some comments about two of the three women who have now accused them of sexual misconduct, Christine Blasey Ford and Deborah Ramirez. Please listen to that, too. 36 years ago? Nobody ever knew about it. Nobody ever heard about it. The second accuser has nothing. The second accuser doesn't even know. She thinks maybe it could have been him, maybe not. She admits that she was drunk. She admits time lapses. Tomorrow's a hearing, as you know, at least tentatively scheduled. Uh, what's your reaction, not just to the president, but to Republican senators, a number of whom on that committee 
you serve with in your days and said, what, what do you feel in reaction to that? Well, I think there's, there's been a level of overall hypocrisy, unfortunately, in the United States Senate, an institution that I loved and served in with Ted Kennedy for years. Um, and I regret that people are saying privately what we all say about Donald Trump. But publicly, Which is what? well, they don't think he's competent to be president. They, they think he is. Uh, they have to. I mean, who was it? Bob Corker said it's adult daycare center down at the White House. You've had others. I mean, Jeff Flake. I mean, a few people who aren't running again have said the truth. But others know it and they talk about it privately. Uh, but they're more concerned about their power as chairman of committees, about their party and protecting the president than they are about upholding their constitutional oath. And I think it's, it's really sad. Now, that's where we are. I'm not gonna, let's not fight about that here now. But the point, the point about what's happening in Washington today, Jim, is, and I say this as a former prosecutor, I mean, I started a rape counseling unit in Middlesex County. We started the first victim witness assistance program to help people through the justice system. Because too often, particularly with sex offenses, People don't talk about it or they don't know how to talk about it. And you can quickly put people on the defensive and not do justice. So uh, what I've learned is that, that for the president to be making these comments, testing veracity, is just wrong. What ought to happen is a proper investigation. And what's extraordinary to me is the United States senators are saying, we're going to listen to her, but I know how I'm going to vote. Well, you know, this isn't going to change anything. They, they've made up their minds. Democrats have made up their mind, too. Well, uh, some Secretary. Democrats have made up their minds. And I think what you need is, is absolutely you have to have a proper investigation here. And frankly, for Kavanaugh's benefit, for his two daughters, for, for the people affected by this, and it's grotesque, this should have been done in, in privacy. And the problem is the Republicans want to jam this. They want to get this through before there's a midterm election. They want to get this through to gin up their base one way or the other. And can so it's been turned into a political But can you event. see, I have to say, I think about this nonstop. My guess is you do too. If even two Republican senators say this man is not fit to be on the Supreme Court, the reality is, in all likelihood, that he will not be on the Supreme Court unless some Democrats right. move over. Can you see 50 or 51 out of 51 Republicans knowing about three, I would argue, credible charges of serious sexual misconduct, and s despite that saying, this guy deserves lifetime tenure on the most important think, card in uh, the world? I think it is clear, without naming names, that one or two Republican senators have already publicly indicated some deep concern about this. I think the surfacing of yet another person mm -hmm. with unvetted accusations will make it even more important that you have appropriate investigation. You know, you mentioned incompetence of the president uh, a minute ago. In a minute ago, incompetence is not a removable offense, as no. you well know. No, but not. inability to discharge the powers and duties of his office could invoke the 25th Amendment. That provision is never yeah, been Yeah, but used. I think, look, has I he, think... Has, he, has that standard been met uh, as far as you are concerned? I, I can't make that judgment from afar. I, I think I have my own feelings about this president's capacity to do the job, but with respect to 25th Amendment, Amendment, I'm not going there. What are I, your personal feelings about I, his capacity? What I will talk? say, Jim, is this, that uh, it is a mistake for anybody to be talking 25th Amendment or impeachment right now, two months away from a midterm election, because it will politicize both. And if you politicize them, you won't do justice to what might or might not be a legitimate uh, evaluation. You have to let the Mueller investigation run its course. And you also, the 25th Amendment, that involves the Vice President of the United States, involves every member of the Cabinet. That's not something we should be kicking around. If they're not prepared to evaluate it or deal with it, it's not going to happen. You write a lot about climate change in your book. Obviously, in addition to the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accord is in great part a product of your work. How much do you worry about the consequences of the United States withdrawal? A lot of people from the Bill McKibbins and others say states will step in, corporations will step well, in, they're cities trying. and towns. They're trying. Is that enough, though? No. No. Nothing. So how much trouble are we in if we stay out? Well, we're in deep trouble even if we're in. That's what I hate to say. Getting out has compounded it because the United States was the principal leader. I mean, uh, with President Obama's 
impetus, I went to China and negotiated with President Xi to bring him into the fold, which they weren't in the Copenhagen negotiations four years earlier. They were leading the G77 nations, the less developed nations, to be against it. Mm -hmm. We brought them, with President Obama, myself, uh, the team, brought them to the table. We had President Obama stand up in Beijing with President Xi announcing what we would jointly do with China to reduce our emissions. That broke the dam and began to bring everybody to Paris in a way that could get it done. But in Paris, we knew we weren't holding the Earth's temperature to, to a two degrees centigrade increase, which is the tipping point, according to scientists. We knew we were sending the marketplace a signal which would spur investment to deal with battery storage, with new energy technologies. And it's the biggest market in the world. But here, here's the problem. We are, as you and I sit here right now, the world is heading towards four degrees centigrade increase in the warming of, our, of, of the planet this century. My grandchildren, your children, are going to live in a world that may become increasingly unlivable according to what's happening. Greater fires, greater floods, and more intensity to storms. And so I, I think it's one of the top two or three national security issues that we face on the planet and the United States should be leading in order to deal with it. You serve with Jim Emhoff, correct? One of the guys who thinks uh, climate change key uh, chair of the committee. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. Uh, Donald Trump says it's a hoax <laughs> perpetrated by the Chinese. I always, do they, well, you, not, forget Trump, Inhoff. Does he believe this or does he use this as a cover to basically deliver the goods to his I, fossil fuel friends? I, I, mean, I can't tell you the answer to that. I believe he believes it. It's been my understanding. He's vehement about it. He's pretty stubborn about it, so that's his position. But look, Donald Trump's decision to pull out of that agreement is going to cost lives in our country and around the world. It is going to cost billions of dollars of damage because we are not doing the things we need to do to face up to less, just three storms last year, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. $265 billion spent to clean up the damage. That's a third of the entire defense budget. It's the equivalent of the Commerce Department, Education Department, and four other departments all put together. This is insanity, what is happening in Washington. And the irony is that this is the greatest job maker there is in the world. It's the biggest market the world's ever seen, the energy market. And if we were moving whole hog to deal with climate, because the solution to climate is energy policy. If we were doing that, Jim, we'd be leading the world in ways that would put us technologically ahead of everybody. You know, after both those things, uh, after the president withdrew from both, I actually thought about you. And how does John Kerry deal with disappointment? I was reading, obviously, reading your book. I went to the <laughs> page about I went to the page right away after uh, Ohio. Uh, yeah. And you go to sleep and no one knows yet what the results are. I woke up, you wrote, early, it felt like a bad dream. I had a new appreciation for what Al Gore had gone through. When I interviewed Al Gore years ago, I said, do you wake up every single day and say, oh, my God, you know, you know what the end of the sentence is? He says, no, I never think about it, which to me is total BS. How do you deal with the disappointment of the Iran deal, of the Paris deal, well, me, of being me, this let me, close let me to being the leader of the free world? How do you deal with well, all one that? One of the things that will leap out at people out of this book is I am a fighter. I, I, I've had disappointments. I've lost this, that. You, you, you cannot get lost in a loss. You, you just can't. It'd be a waste of a life. But that's like an intellectual But that's response. why this book is called Every Day is Extra. We, all of us who were lucky enough to come back from Vietnam, who were in my close-knit group at least, knew we were lucky, knew we had a privilege to live a life that others didn't get to live. And so I write about that. It's in the author's note that, that there's a responsibility that comes with that. There's a gift. It's, it's, a, it's something you can't describe, but uh, but you, you have to live a life of purpose as a result. So I decided after I lost the presidency, I mean, I felt crappy for whatever number of weeks. Uh, but I said, you know, I can't, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to get out. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I lost it. Okay, go back and do everything you can because I'm still a United States senator. I'm going to be chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. We can make things happen. And I went out for it. And okay. Can we, it speaking of wars, can we talk about two that are not Vietnam? In your book, you write that uh, the Iraq war authorization vote under George W. My vote was the single biggest mistake I made in 28 years as a U.S. senator. A number of people who worked for you on your presidential campaign said the vote was politically motivated, that you decided to take that vote, which seems not like that young guy we saw a minute ago, no, because you were concerned you couldn't be elected president if you voted against the war resolution. No. 
That's not accurate. What is accurate is that I felt that it was a presidential decision, in effect, that, that if I were president, I would have wanted the leverage to be able to get Saddam Hussein to open up to inspections. And one of the best ways to do that would have been with a legitimate threat. Now, we envisioned passing an amendment which would have required a second vote before you went to war. And the Republicans denied that. So, uh, you know, I met with Colin Powell, Secretary of State. We listened very carefully to the president's averments to us. They promised, they promised they would exhaust the diplomatic remedies before they went to war. They promised they would build a legitimate coalition before they went to war. Uh, and they promised they would do it in not as a rush to, 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 to go to war. And, and every one of those promises were broken. And we were left holding the hat. I wasn't alone in that. I mean, Bob Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, a whole bunch of people had the same attitude. You've got to be responsible in how you're trying to manage this. But I went to the U.N. Security Council. I met with everybody on the council. I said, look, if we... If we go for another three months and we try to press Saddam Hussein to open up inspections, will you guys then be willing to support force if that's what it took? And they all said yes. So my, th my theory of the case was we're voting for, uh, for leverage. We're, we're not rushing away. And if you read my speech on the floor of the Senate, that's exactly what I said. I said I am not voting to go to war. But that doesn't get... That distinction does not get drawn, particularly in a presidential race. Let's talk about one other war for a second. I have to say, from what I've read in your book so far, one of the most moving pieces actually doesn't involve what you did, but what you observed. Can you tell people briefly about what you and your wife observed when you, were, when you took her to Normandy? Well, it, it, Normandy is a sacred ground. To, it should be to all of us. Uh, I, I view it as a remarkable place because of what happened there. The, the story of those young soldiers coming in on those Higgin boats and being dropped behind enemy lines in the 101st Airborne and 82nd. And it's a remarkable story of courage, of American uh, guts, and, and uh, it's why we're terrific fighters as a country. We are good fighters. But I went back years later with Teresa. We weren't yet married, but I wanted to share with her that place and some of our family history. And we sat there for several hours watching the tide come in. And while we were sitting there, there was a couple sitting in front of us, an older gentleman, and, and I presumed his wife. And they were in a tight sort of embrace. And at one point, after a couple of hours, he just stood up. He took off all his clothes, buck naked, unabarrassed, unabashed. I don't think he saw us. And he just walked into the water. And he floated back and forth in the water. And I, you know, I sort of, I mean, this was a purification exercise or something where he was visiting his friends, visiting the moment. That's very moving. Very moving to read about it, too, Secretary. You know, speaking of uh, Vietnam, you had an incredible relationship with John McCain on yeah. <laughs> much of which you didn't agree with. One of the things, I mean, I am of the belief, I'm sure I'm not alone, obviously I'm not alone, the raw partisanship, the, the, the polarization is grotesque and in great part why we're in this mess. But then I read in your book that... You were, how close were you to picking John McCain as your running mate in 2004? Well, we never got, as, as I said in the book, we dated, we, we flirted, <laughs> but we never dated. Uh, how far did the flirtation go? Well, the flirtation went to the point, we were serious about thinking about this. We were trying to figure out, could it work? I was trying to figure it out. He had to make a big choice that he was going to run with a Democrat, and, and it would have meant uh, his party would have been outraged and furious at him. Uh, he obviously thought something of the idea because four years later he thought of putting Joe Lieberman, Lieberman on the ticket. So I think he saw a virtue in it, but he probably saw the virtue if he was on the top of the ticket. Uh, that said, uh, I thought, and he did, that we needed different politics in the country. We needed to bring the country together. We needed to show that we could be bipartisan. And John and I had come from a very different places, obviously. He, 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 from being a POW for five and a half years, I was, you know, fighting a war in the, in the, in the, on the water in the Delta. And when I came back, I was a protester. And, and the guys in, in the prison camps didn't love, they didn't like us as protesters. And it was exploited by the Vietnamese. So we were wary of each other at first in the Senate, but then we were flying to Kuwait after the war for an inspection and John and I talked into the night, 
And we found a meeting of the minds that we both knew we needed to change America's relationship with the Vietnam War. And we needed to see Vietnam as a country, not a war anymore. It was strategically interesting. So we worked for 10 years together to lift the embargo, mm. to normalize relations with two different presidents, with Clinton and H.W. Bush. And ultimately, um, we, we, we were able, I think, to, we were able to get answers for the families of loved ones lost in Vietnam for over 700 families. We managed to find what happened to them. We managed to bring back remains. They managed to have closure. And I think it helped us actually to, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, make peace not only with Vietnam, but we made peace with ourselves here in this country. That flirtation uh, was in 2004. You've been asked recently about whether you're contemplating doing it again in 2020. You've said you haven't thought about it all, but you wouldn't rule it out. Wh why? What well, ruling it, I mean, I, I don't rule a lot of things out, but it doesn't mean I'm going to go do them. Um, but I think that uh, it's a mistake for anybody, and I've said this as clearly as I can. We shouldn't be fooling around with thinking about talking about flirting with 2020 right now. In 40 days, I think it is, or so, somewhere around there, we have a midterm course correction opportunity. And we have an opportunity to win back the House and possibly the Senate. Every bit of energy, all the money, all the time, all the effort ought to be going to, to, uh, to win uh, in November. And that course correction could be the greatest single step we all could imagine or take in order to redress the excesses and the chaos of this current administration. What would cause you to do more than uh, uh, not rule it out, John Kerry? I mean, I, I, I think it would depend on, so, I mean, I haven't, obviously you can tell, I haven't really thought through what all the qualities are, but certainly the question of whether or not I believe uh, whatever the field is, is, is one that can win or, or you know. You only have a minute left. Uh, uh, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin was here the other day. Uh, yesterday, DeRay McKesson from Black Lives Matter. A couple of weeks before that, John Meacham. I asked them all if they have hope for the future. Unanimity, every single one of them, in ways that I think I felt they meant, said they were hopeful despite disparaging virtually everything that's going on now in Washington. Are you hopeful? And if you are, I'm, why I, are I'm you? I'm actually hopeful? more than hopeful. Why I, are I'm you? optimistic. Why? I, you have a minute. I'm optimistic because I believe we're doing things on this planet that we never contemplated we could do. We're curing diseases we never thought we'd cure. We've brought 450 million people out of poverty in China, 400 million in India. When I was in college, the poverty, severe poverty rate of the world was 50%. Now it's less than 10%. We're on the brink of the first generation of kids being born in Africa AIDS-free. We stopped Ebola when we put our minds to it. We are... Uh, you know, we're living longer. We're living a higher quality of life, most people. If you're a woman anywhere in the world today, you're 50% more likely in childbirth to live and 50% more, more likely that your child is going to live and go to school. I can find all kinds of metrics. Far fewer people are dying violently in this century than died in the last century. So, yes, every problem we face, Jim, is human-caused. It's subject to a solution. Take climate change. Energy policy is the solution to climate change. So let's get people in there who are ready to move America away from fossil fuels, not open up smog from tailpipes, not fill our lakes and streams with, with ash from coal, but do the right things that we've done before and know how to do. That's why I'm optimistic. 1970, Richard Nixon attacked the Justice Department, had an enemies list, was a crook, lied, fired the special prosecutor, and we had bombs in our streets, assassinations in America, and we came back from it. He won 49 states. A year and a half later, he was gone. I believe in the future. I really do. The optimism of a door-to-door -door encyclopedia. So no, it's the optimism you. of a guy who has uh, been close to being killed many times and who believes every day being extra we have an opportunity to make a difference. We can make a difference. We've done it before and we will do it now. John Kerry, it's great to see Thank you. you. Congratulations on the Thanks book. A lot. Thank you so Appreciate much. It. Again, the book is Every Day is Extra.